The Honorable Justices of the Supreme Court of the State of Iowa. Hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable Supreme Court of the State of Iowa is now in session. Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. Well, this is like a first day of school for us. It's, we're back in a new term. So welcome, everybody, for our first oral argument of the 2022-2023 term. We have four cases this morning that are set. Um, the case of James Farnsworth versus State of Iowa is hereby submitted without oral argument. And the case of Iowa Supreme Court Attorney Disciplinary Board versus Wesley Allen Johnson is also hereby submitted without oral argument. Our first argument for the case for the state um, for the day is State of Iowa versus Cameron James Hess. Uh, Mr. Irwin, are you prepared? And Mr. Slovin? Okay, thank you. You may begin, Mr. Irwin. Irwin, excuse me. Chief Justice, may it please the court, counsel. Josh Irwin on behalf of the appellant, Cameron Hess. The Iowa Code and the United States and Iowa Constitutions provide sentencing courts discretion to determine whether punishments designed for adults should be applied to juvenile offenders. But in this case, the district court did not recognize the scope of its discretion. I'll begin by discussing the statutory argument that section 901.5 sub 13 allows district courts to suspend the special sentence and the sex offender registry. Um, beginning with regard to the special sentence, um, it has been established to be punishment as well as expressly part of the criminal sentence um, in State v. Lathrop and again just last year in Doss v. State. Um, it's also specifically enumerated in section 901.5 sub 12 as part of the mandatory sentence. Um, uh, since it specifically says that it is uh, mandatory in subsection 12, uses the word shall right next to 13, how do we reconcile those two? Hmm. I think by recognizing that subsection 13 overrides shalls um, in section 901.5 generally as well as throughout the code by allowing um, suspension of any part of the sentence notwithstanding any other portion of the code. Um, I, I think that that's exactly what s section 13, subsection 13 does is turn those shalls into maze with regard to juvenile offenders. Against to the, the fact that in subsection 12 and in 903b1, it uses the term special sentence, and 13 just says it gives the court the discretion to, to uh, suspend a sentence. Did the legislature mean two different things? Honor, um, I think that in the broad language of 901.5 sub 13, using the word sentence, I think that was intended to reach all things which qualify as part of the sentence under the code. Um, and despite being called the special sentence in the code um, in Lathrop and in Doss v. State, um, this court has held that the special sentence is both punishment and expressly part of the criminal sentence. Um, I think that that demonstrates that um, even though it's not the same as incarceration, for example, um, it is still part of the sentence for purposes of section 901.5 sub 13. The 13 refers to uh, sentencing, including a minimum, mandatory minimum sentence. In context, should we read sentence to mean incarceration or a prison sentence and not applicable to a special sentence of parole? Um, I think that, although I, I recognize that sub 13 does make reference to um, mandatory minimum sentences, but those turn back to the use of the more general term sentence. I think that the use of that language is making completely clear that, that this subsection covers everything. 
um, if, if there were any question about its application to otherwise mandatory minimum sentences, um, the word sentence encompasses those. And I also think a reading that limits this to incarceration or mandatory incarceration or even turning further a mandatory minimum incarceration would exclude lots of things which are definitely part of the sentence and which I think the legislature was thinking of when they enacted this subsection. Um, for instance, there are offenses which require incarceration but don't carry a mandatory minimum term. Um, the C felony willful injury, there are a couple of other felony assault offenses that require incarceration. Um, I think it's, it's definitely within the legislature's purview that those would be included in this subsection as well. So I do think the language um, reaches more than just mandatory minimum terms of incarceration. Does it matter to our statutory analysis that typically a sentence is administered by a judge or a court, probationary services, and the special sentence is a parole sentence, and it would be administered and supervised by another uh, department. Should that matter? No, Your Honor. Um, it is still a, a sentence imposed by the sentencing judge. Um, and there are already somewhat analogous circumstances where the special sentence is in effect suspended, um, that specifically being in the case when an offender receives a deferred judgment. The special sentence is not imposed at the time, but it is kind of hanging over them as motivation to abide by the terms of their parole. Um, and as a specific consequence that, um, that is hanging over them in the event that, um, that they violated the terms of their probation. Um, so no, I don't think the fact that it is um, a, a parole sentence rather than a sentence of incarceration brings it outside the scope of section 901.5 sub 13, especially when it has been held um, to constitute punishment. Does the rule of lenity do any work here? It could, Your Honor. Um, I think, you know, in, in this question, well, first, so I don't think that it is ambiguous whether the special sentence falls under 901.5 sub 13, given the holdings that I've referenced. But if it is ambiguous, yes, I think the rule of lenity would play a role um, in, in deferring to the defendant um, because they may, it may not have been clear whether or not these consequences fell within subsection 13. Um, STH, I mean, even regardless of where we land on the, the district court having discretion or not, um, she's not going to have discretion, the court's not going to have discretion if it's unconstitutional to impose it in this circumstance. So does TH apply here? Um, and um, it, it applies because when you, I think very little changes with regard to the intent effects analysis um, under the circumstances here. Um, it is true and I acknowledge that in TH the court did acknowledge some consequences which are particular to juvenile, um, juveniles who are in juvenile court and who are below the age of majority at the time of sentencing. Um, but I still think that the analysis in TH um, recognize that there is an affirmative disability or restraint here. Um, the, the impact of his reaching the age of majority perhaps means that carries slightly lesser weight. The concerns about being able to associate with his peer groups maybe is not as weighty. But there is nonetheless still an affirmative disability or restraint. Um, the, the residency restrictions, et cetera. Um, most importantly, um, to the ruling in TH was that the, um, the registry is excessive in light of the legislative purpose of preventing recidivism with regard to juvenile offenders. That applies with equal force here. Um, Mr. Hess, despite reaching the age of majority while the case was pending, was a juvenile offender when, when these offenses occurred. Um, and that means that he is more capable of change um, and it means that, Your Honor. Slight distinction though, TH didn't deal with juveniles necessarily as juveniles. It dealt with persons charged as juveniles and indicated that that charging decision made a distinction because the purpose there was more rehabilitative. 
is what we do in juvenile court generally. Here, there's already been a decision made that this person should be charged as an adult offender, so those interests kind of go away at that point. Isn't that right? I, I disagree with that, Your Honor, and that's because still the questions of the likelihood of recidivism among juvenile offenders, whether they're tried in adult court or in juvenile court, that data doesn't change depending on the courtroom where they land. Um, the proceeding changes, right? 232 proceedings, delinquency proceedings, are supposed to be non-punitive in nature, generally. And that is not true with adult offenders. And I know one of our goals of punishment is rehabilitation, but there are also punitive or retribution aspects associated with charging crime. Doesn't that make a distinction? So I understand the, the distinction between the, goal, the, the rehabilitative focus in juvenile court and the, the punitive aspect of punishment in adult court. Um, but I still, I don't think that changes the ultimate conclusion that application of the sex offender registry is punishment as to juveniles. Um, because again, and I, I don't mean to repeat myself, but that still doesn't, the purpose of the registry is to prevent recidivism. And the data on juvenile recidivism is that rates are, are very low um, compared to adult offenders. Um, and so on, and also that they are more capable of rehabilitation. Um, and I think even in adult court, that capability for rehabilitation is something that must be considered in, in weighing the sentencing options. Question about the registry. First of all, would you agree with me that the um, avenue you're taking is under Chapter 692A, is what, what you're leaning on, why you think the court has discretion with this particular defendant? I'm so, so I think... Right? Is, is the um, vehicle that you are arguing well, the, a judge having discretion? The registry chapter, 901.513 is what gives the judge sentencing discretion. 692A, and it is splattered throughout there about juvenile court, juvenile court, uh, um, discharge of the juvenile. In this case, you know the record better than I. Did the juvenile at the time attempt to keep it in juvenile court, or was it immediately charged in district court? filed and there was a reverse waiver hearing which was denied your honor and obviously that's the importance of that reverse waiver hearing they fight like heck because they know if you can keep it in juvenile court or get it in juvenile court there's a really um, good likelihood that perhaps the registry could be waived doesn't that imply that the legislature did not allow for that exception to go beyond so if he if he gets out if he's not in juvenile court he loses out on that statutory benefit doesn't he I think so, Your Honor, because I still think that um, 901.5 sub 13, I think the core push of that is to provide protections to juvenile offenders who have landed in adult court. And I think that in considering whether that subsection reaches the registry, I think consideration of the juvenile court provisions that you reference is important. The fact that um, in juvenile court, they don't necessarily have to impose the registry at the outset. Even in cases when they do have to impose the registry at the outset, it can be altered later with no mandatory minimum term. Um, so I, I think that 901.5 sub 13 is the legislature's attempt to sort of balance the, um, the nature of criminal court and juvenile court when we have situations like this when juvenile offenders um, can land in, in criminal court. Um, I have a practical question for you. If, you're, if your interpretation of the statute is correct and the district court can suspend the special sentence, let's assume you have a defendant who's on probation uh, or how would the special sentence be administered? If, if it is suspended? Correct. So at the time of the sentencing hearing, the judge says, I suspend the term of incarceration, I suspend a special sentence, the defendant is now on probation. How is the special sentence administered? During the term of probation, the special sentence um, would not take effect the same way other suspended sentences do not, um, but it would serve as motivation to, to abide by the terms of probation at the risk defendant or the offender discharges probation successfully, then what happens? Um, 
the, the same thing that would happen with a suspended sentence of incarceration, Your Honor. It, it would not be imposed, and it's, it, it's simply not imposed on them. Uh, ask a question. In regard, going back to the, the registry uh, part of the appeal, um, in your briefing and in your argument today, um, you focus on the prevention of recidivism as if that is the only purpose of uh, the registration requirement. I think if you ask the average Iowan out there, they would probably say that giving information to the public so the public can order their lives accordingly is also a purpose of the registry. Isn't that, isn't that fair? Well, I think, though, that the way the registry, it's just the very nature of the registry, that it only applies to persons who have committed a first offense. So it's, yes, I suppose it, it does provide that information to the public, but only as to prior offenders. Um, it, it can't warn the public of every person who might commit a sex offense because it only reaches those who have been previously convicted. I see my time is expiring, so I will request that this court hold that 901.5 sub 13 uh, allows district courts to suspend the special sentence and the registry, and that um, the mandatory minimum term that one must serve on the registry uh, constitutes cruel and unusual punishment as applied to juvenile offenders. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chief Justice, and may it please the court. Good morning, it's a privilege to be here. I'll start with the 901.513. The notwithstanding clause of 901.513 has two parts. First, it says notwithstanding section 907.3, and then notwithstanding any other provision providing a mandatory minimum sentence for the offense. I think that the way to read 901.513 is uh, in context of the decisions that it was uh, enacted in response to, like Granby, Florida, Null, Pearson, Ragland. And then in light of that, notwithstanding. Wait, I thought this statute came before Null. Am I wrong? I, I'm, I may be incorrect about that, but I think it postdated Null. Null was summer of 2013. The statute was 2013 legislative session. I might be wrong. I, I know that it was cited in Lyle as, uh, as it was still in the legislative process. It hadn't yet been enacted during Lyle, but it was cited in the Lyle decision. Um, but it's definitely a response to Graham versus Florida. And uh, the notwithstanding 907.3 and any other provision imposing a mandatory minimum sentence uh, means this statute intends to put the range of options available in 907.3 uh, in the discretion of the sentencing court um, as though all of those options were available. But it doesn't authorize new options beyond what 907.3 would, would authorize a sentencing court to impose. It doesn't create a new flavor of sentencing option that's not available anywhere else in the Iowa Code. Uh, and that's what uh, Mr. Hess's interpretation would do, it would um, create a new sentence of a suspended parole. Uh, it would even authorize a sentencing court to say, under 907.3, I'm going to suspend the sentence uh, in, a, in a different case. And then under 901.513, I'm going to suspend that suspended sentence, um, notwithstanding the provisions of 907.3 that say I have to suspend or defer. I'm going to suspend that too, um, a double layered suspended sentence. So, and, and I don't think that that is, we read the legislation in light of the purpose that it's intended to achieve and in context. I'd also point out that, as Richardson says, the term mandatory minimum sentence, as it's used elsewhere in the code, typically refers to uh, incarceration of some kind. And uh, I, I also think that one of the things Richardson points out about the restitution award is that it's always mandatory, never within the discretion of the sentencing court to defer or suspend. The same is true with the special sentence under Chapter 903B. Um, if this court disagrees on that this issue, the remedy is resentencing just for the purpose of the, the sentencing court to uh, make a discretionary determination as to whether to apply uh, the special sentence or suspend or defer it under 901.513. Uh, 
Justice McDonald, I think you're right. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure administratively what that would look like. Um, and I think that's another thing this court has to consider is, because um, I don't think this. Focusing on that, Mr. Sullivan, I mean, isn't Mr. Irwin correct that when the court uh, suspends the, the sentence and puts the defendant on parole, excuse me, on probation, they're always suspending the parole part of the sentence when they do that, right? So this, how would this be different? So it would be different because there would be a suspended sentence that when revoked results in placement on, uh, on parole. Um, it would kind of be, it would be a double layered suspended punishment, which isn't something that you see any, anywhere else um, in the Iowa code. Um, I, I would agree that in many respects, the, the procedure would look a lot like an ordinary suspended sentence and that the first thing that would happen would be probation, probation and then revocation would follow if necessary. Um, but it would be unique in that it would be a double layered um, supervisionary process. Um, but I, I think the reason we ask for attention is to consider the, the sex offender registration issue in the gap between Enri TH and Ashbrenner, um, and also to ask this court to reconsider and overrule Enri TH, because the sex offender registry requirements are not punishment. Um, they're not punishment when applied. If we agree with the district court that this is only to Ashbrenner, do we overrule TH? I think that you could affirm the district court and distinguish in RETH. Um, I, I do think that it's relevant and uh, probably pivotal that this is in a criminal court and not a juvenile proceeding. However, um, this is the right vehicle, this is, this is the right case to overrule in RETH because the policy consequences, the burdens uh, created by in RETH continue to stack and accumulate uh, over time. It, uh, of of the burdens that that's creating? So the reason it creates burdens is because um, D uh, DPS has to uh, administer separately sex offender registration requirements for, uh, juvenile, uh, for uh, juvenile adjudications based on when those were entered uh, rather than continually updating them as it would with, with any other. Uh, that's creating problems for DPS or I'm not sure um, what the basis is for in this record about the burden on DPS, no, Your Honor. Um, but I think it was recognized in the in the dissent in in RTH that this is going to create administrative burdens, and, and I, I would say uh, already has created a problem in that um, one problem is that for offenders who were uh, adjudicated in juvenile proceedings in other jurisdictions and then come to Iowa, they uh, to require them to register as sex offenders in Iowa now counts as an ex post facto punishment for those offenders, um, which not only exempts those, uh, creates a huge gap in our sex offender registry requirement statutory schema, it also threatens our compliance with SORNA, that uh, offenders that are within that over the age of 14 and- Is to come forward before or so to decide that? Well, it's, it's, so in some, uh, one of the problems is that it's unlikely to find that case because it would have to be a state's challenge to the exercise of discretion in a juven, uh, juvenile proceeding. Um, and then you would always be able to say that on a the juvenile, as, as Chief Justice Christensen pointed out, Chapter 692A already provides for the district court to be able to have discretion in uh, making applicable the registration requirement for uh, an offender adjudicated in a juvenile proceeding. So the state wouldn't even be able to bring a challenge that says the court uh, should not have had discretion, you should overrule TH. So you're never gonna get that case. Um, and I, I think that the, um, I, I think there is some, I would agree with you that it's possible to affirm and just distinguish in re-TH and say, um, if it has vitality at all, it's only limited to adjudications and juvenile proceedings. However, the burdens are still there, um, and the I, I don't really see an avenue for this court to get a case challenging an, an adjudicate a sex offender registration decision in a juvenile adjudication because the statute already gives that authority. Um, and also, in RTH already said it's not cruel and unusual punishment, so you can't get a challenge on that uh, through that avenue either to a challenge to a finding by a district court that says it is cruel and unusual punishment. Kind of, I mean, you've 
seems to me, come up with a lot better arguments than I had in the dissent. But in a sense, TH was kind of dicta because, you, you know, in the end, they sustained the the majority sustained the registry requirement on the grounds that it wasn't cruel and unusual. So what they did decide was this ex post facto issue, which was the one that wasn't before them, right? right. Created an issue. What TH could have said was, assuming this is punishment, it's not cruel and unusual. Um, but I, I think that you're right that um, TH created an ex post facto issue that wasn't really before it, that it didn't need to decide to adjudicate that particular challenge. Um, I, I would direct this court um, on the issue of affirmative restraint or disability. Or I'm sorry, in the issue of, of uh, uh, availability of information, which I think is one, that is one difference between the criminal proceeding and the juvenile adjudication. Um, even for offenders uh, in a juvenile adjudication, I would submit that TH is wrong to say that that's equivalent to public shaming. I commend this court to the discussion in Doe versus Settle, which is a Fourth Circuit case that cites in RE-TH. Um, the Fourth Circuit goes through and discusses public shaming punishments historically. And I think it distills three ingredients that you're looking for to say that uh, where dissemination of information kind of rises to the level of public shaming and becomes punishment. One of those ingredients is some ingredient of corporal punishment associated with it, like stocks or pillories. Another ingredient is mass confrontation, uh, like creating a situation where the entire community confronts a person. And another condition is uh, physically wearing the badge of the, of the shaming and carrying it around like a sandwich board or like the, the scarlet letter sewn into garments in that Massachusetts law that was the basis for the book. Um, this does not have any of those three ingredients. This is like um, the, you know, just as the US Supreme Court said in Smith um, and as numerous other circuits have, have considered uh, and I think written persuasively on, dissemination of this information is not public shaming. And, uh, and Justice Mansfield, as you pointed out, this is essential to the non-punitive uh, public safety purpose of allowing Iowans to get the information that they need to order, uh, order their lives and protect themselves against the risk of sex offender rec recidivism. Comparison for uh, recidivism, is it juvenile sex offenders to adult uh, sex offenders or is it juvenile sex offenders to the rest of the population of juveniles? to the rest of the population. I mean, for, for an Iowan going about their life, the comparison would be this person, the risk of, of sex offense uh, from this person compared to any other person. Um, that if, if you told somebody that the uh, up, as a policy matter, we've determined that the statutory scheme that would have informed you that this person presents a possible risk of sex offender recidivism, that that um, the risk was too low for that infor for informing you to be required because the risk was only 4%. I think that an Iowa parent would, would look at you with disbelief and say, um, a 4% risk that um, someone in my family could be the victim of a sexual offense is, is, I would say that that's high and I would reorder my behavior in order to avoid or mitigate that risk. Um, I also think you're, you should talk about the severity. I mean, when we make risk calculations, we talk about the severity of the thing to be avoided, the severity of the event that's being risked. Uh, and sex offense victimization is a pretty severe harm, as this court has recognized. Um, so I, I think that, I mean, I think in RTH is right in one sense, that juvenile sex offenders have a, a lower uh, recidivism rate in some respects than adult sex offenders. I, I think our brief kind of capture, tries to, uh, give a complete portrait of what we know from that data, that for juveniles, it's somewhere in a range of 4 to 14%. Um, actually, the high end of that range is about where the adult sex offender recidivism rate is. It's something like 13 or 14%. Um, but that is that represents something on the order of a 1,000 times more than the risk that any person selected at random would commit a sexual offense against a, a, another person. Um, and so I think that... And, and it's, it's not about, I'd say the bar for what this has to, this recidivism rate has to be is low. I think the Ninth Circuit recognized that in uh, Masto, I believe is the case, that um, the analysis is, is the non-punitive interest clearly excessive, or I'm sorry, is the, is the measure clearly excessive in, in light of the non-punitive interest? And this is 
a level of recid like yes, four percent is one of the lower uh, numbers that we have on a one to one hundred scale, but that's still a large risk of a pretty severe adverse event happening that people would want to guard against, and so it's not clearly excessive in relation to the non-punitive interest that's being advanced, which is public safety, preventing that recidivism, and allowing people. Do the underlying facts of the offense here matter in our constitutional analysis as we're looking at TH and Ashbrenner? As I understand it, um, there were multiple uh, criminal acts over an extended period of time, maybe even a break in between acts indicating a heightened risk of recidivism as to this offender. Is that relevant in our analysis? Relevant for a cruel and unusual punishment analysis, certainly. I think it's also relevant when you, because a decision that this is punishment or isn't punishment would be applicable to all, I mean, TH says it is punishment for all juveniles. I don't, I don't really understand the distinction how it's punishment for juveniles and not punishment for anybody else. Um, but the, I, I take your point that um, the facts in this case show that there is a heightened recidivism risk and the risk assessment bears that out in this case. And if it's, um, I think that you would consider this as just illustrating the universe of cases that you, your decision applies to when you're determining, is this clearly excessive in relation to the non-punitive purpose? The non-punitive purpose here is to prevent recidivism risk presented by this category of offenders that includes offenders like Hess, um, who have those, that history of offenses that create, uh, that illustrate that high risk of recidivism. And so to say this isn't punishment and the community, um, you know, to notify the community of that recidivism risk is clearly excessive in relation to, like, I, I think that this illustrates why that's misguided. Um, and Sophie's Choice, you've got two arguments here. Do you think that the district court does have discretion in both the uh, special sentence and the sex offender registration? Which of those two arguments do you think is the strongest argument for the state? Discretion. I, I think that the stronger argument for the state is that um, TH was incorrectly decided and that the district court did not have discretion over whether to require, uh, has to register as a sex offender. That That's the argument that I think we're, um, you know, that's our focus here. Um, and yeah, I, th I think that, I see my time's expired, if I can just briefly conclude the answer. Um, a contrary holding on that would sabotage a lot of uh, public safety interests and efforts to make sure Iowans are informed of the risks that sex offender recidivism presents. Um, and, and I think that's our real interest here is to make sure that that public safety interest can be furthered. Thank you. Mr. Irwin. Thank you, Your Honor. I want to just ended with him. Which of your two arguments do you think is stronger for your position? It's under 901.5 sub 13. Um, I think. Both of those issues. I'm, I'm, I think, I mean, both of them involve discretion of the district court and um, they're similar but different. Which one do you think is, is more of a no-brainer from your position? So I think that the most clear is that 901.5 sub 13 allows suspension of the special sentence, given the way it's already been clearly defined as a sentence. Um, that said, I don't think it's that far of a reach to say that that discretion reaches um, the registry as applied to juvenile offenders, given that it has been held to constitute punishment in those instances. And I do want to emphasize, none of these issues would remove the power of district courts to place juvenile offenders on the registry. They would just give them the power to make an individualized assessment at the outset whether that outcome is appropriate, um, and even whether it's appropriate to suspend, um, because that, even th that wouldn't mean that the possibility of the registry is just gone. It could still be there in the event that there's problems on probation down the line. Um, Justice McDonald, you asked about the underlying facts of this case. Uh, I believe the underlying facts of this case are irrelevant for purposes of the appeal. They certainly would be relevant in the um, 
in the circumstance, if this case were remanded, if, if this court held in Mr. Hess's favor, absolutely, the court would consider those facts when evaluating in its discretion whether to suspend the, the special sentence and the punishment. But I think for the questions presented to this court on appeal, the underlying circumstances are irrelevant. The, the um, constitutional challenge is a categorical challenge, not an as-applied challenge. Um, so I, I don't think that the specific circumstances matter for purposes of the decision that this court will make. Sloven's argument about the notwithstanding language in 9015 uh, sub 13, should we in context interpret the power to, or the discretion to suspend as meaning a prison sentence? Your Honor, and I think it's easy enough to dispose of by recognizing that if the legislature had meant this subsection only to imply to incarceration, that would have been very easy to write. They would have used the word incarceration. If they only meant it to apply to mandatory minimum sentences, same answer. They would have only said mandatory minimum sentences. But by using the word sentence, I think the legislature gave district courts broad authority. And again, I think it's um, in an effort to make some balance between the protections that exist in juvenile court, which would include the ability to um, not impose the registry or alter it before a mandatory minimum term has passed. Interpretation of the statute, the district court could sentence a defendant to prison, but also suspend the special sentence. Is that right? That is a, a I take your point, Your Honor, and it is something that I considered. Um, I suppose under the statute, I suppose they could. The Isn't that required under your reading? You just told us uh, during this oral and in your briefing, the statute gives the district court the discretion to suspend any part of the sentence. Yes. Offender is released from prison uh, and the district court's already suspended the special sentence, then what happens? And I, I take your point. Um, I think that as a practical matter, I don't see any district court doing that. Um, and that, that may be something um, that this court would have to consider if. It, I think there are a certain, uh, maybe there's a certain view that the special sentence is too punitive and that a prison sentence is long enough. So what happens under your interpretation of the statute when an offender is released from prison and the special sentence has been suspended? Well, um, so I suppose they, that perhaps there would be a term of probation and it, it would kind of depend on, uh, upon release from prison if, if they are released on parole or if they fully discharged. Um, but I suppose, yes, there could be a term of post-incarceration probation um, where that special sentence would be hanging over them. B, the district court doesn't administer parole. If the defendant violates parole, let's assume the defendant is on parole, the violation is determined by an ALJ, not a district court judge. So are you saying that the ALJ will have to decide to impose a sentence? Your Honor, um, I believe, and I do see that I'm a bit over time, if I may. Still. I think that under that circumstance, and I, I recognize that it would be unusual um, or different from the normal practice that we see, um, but the terms of probation would continue to be supervised by the district court. There effectively would be, if they were on parole, they, they would be under two, under administrative supervision um, from the, the board of parole and under the supervision of the court. I guess, I'm not sure, is there a statute that you can point to that would provide authority for the district court to supervise parole? I mean, you keep saying probation, but it's not probation. Once somebody's discharged from prison, it's parole. What statute gives the district court authority to supervise, supervise parole? Well, and so, I mean, it would be probation with regard to the suspended special sentence under the terms of 901.5 sub 13. Um, so I believe it would be separate from parole supervision. Um, and I, I do recognize that that creates an interesting question of this parallel supervision. Um, and it is something that 
901.513 perhaps um, should be clarified with that regard how that would apply. But I think just allowing suspension of any part of the sentence under 901.5 sub 13 could allow for such an outcome. Thank you. State versus Cameron Hess is hereby submitted. We'll take a brief break, but remain on the bench until we have our next case.